Welcome to the FAA's webinar series on advanced air mobility. I'm Colleen D'Alessandro, Regional Administrator for FAA's New England region. Today, FAA will initiate a conversation with industry, airports, and state governments about their roles in advanced air mobility community engagement. First, I'd like to introduce Paul Fontaine, FAA's Assistant Administrator for NextGen, for a few opening remarks. Thank you, Colleen, and good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> we want to welcome you to the fourth episode of our Advanced Air Mobility webinar series. Um, so far, we've introduced you to the world of AAM and discussed very specific topics such as vertiport development and weight considerations. For today's sessions, we're shifting our focus to communities. Advanced Air Mobility has the potential to be truly transformational and bring new transportation capabilities to a neighborhood near you soon. As the FAA focuses on planning for the safe integration of these operations into our skies, we're fully committed to facilitating a meaningful engagement and open dialogue with different stakeholder communities to gain a mutual understanding of advanced air mobility. And we're gonna do that today with this webinar series. So the FAA plays two important roles in advanced air mobility. The first is actually certifying the aircraft for use. And the second is safely integrating them into our airspace. But we also work very closely with industry, state, local governments, and along with the public uh, to better understand and clarify the roles and responsibilities of each stakeholder when it comes down to planning for the engagement of AAM into the communities. We encourage the advanced air mobility manufacturers and operators to engage communities early, uh, to educate them, and to understand how these operations will affect both parties. Engagement at the local level is most effective when everyone shares from a common, common knowledge base. In today's webinar, we're going to walk through these ideas in a series of presentations, followed by a fireside chat. And we really hope that you uh, find this to be a meaningful engagement today. So Colleen, I'm going to turn it back over to you to begin today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Before I hand it off to our panelists, I'll kick things off with a quick background discussion on engagement, roles, and responsibilities, our goals for the conversation today, and then I'll introduce the panel. Today, we'll discuss what community leaders need to consider when planning for advanced air mobility in their communities. As AAM moves closer to reality, we wanted to bring together FAA and other AAM stakeholders for an important conversation on where and when engagement needs to happen. With this webinar, the FAA wants to initiate a conversation with state and local government leadership who are considering AAM operations. The goal is to help that leadership and the public better understand the roles and responsibilities for planning and engagement for AAM in their community. The FAA's job as Paul said, is to ensure this next generation of aircraft maintains the high level of safety that defines commercial aviation today. This effort will involve the following FAA responsibilities. Certifying the designs of these aircraft with the AAM manufacturers, finalizing the operating framework, such as pilot qualifications and training, and lastly, integrating these new operations into the existing aviation system. So what are we gonna talk about today? The goals for today's webinar include to highlight the roles and responsibilities of stakeholders as communities consider AAM operations, to emphasize the FAA's primary role in safely integrating AAM and controlling the airspace, and to facilitate a conversation with state and local governments and highlight key topics and responsibilities for when communities consider AAM operations. So what is advanced air mobility? According to the AAM Leadership and Coordination Act, AAM is a transportation system that moves people and property by air between two points in the United States. AAM will use aircraft with advanced technologies, including electric aircraft or electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, in both controlled and uncontrolled airspace. Initial AAM operations are expected to include passenger carrying or cargo flights with a pilot on board. 
It's important to recognize that the FAA and industry both acknowledge that this is a dynamic industry with many new and exciting opportunities for advanced air mobility on the horizon. As we move into the panel presentations, we hope to enable a better understanding of how this process will evolve. This should help community leaders who are making choices about AAM operations. Engagement may be on land use, on infrastructure, or the value of the service to the community. It's important to understand everything that is part of a decision like this and the long-term implications. In every decision, there are benefits and potential disbenefits. These are investments that come with a long-term responsibility. Knowing what to expect now and what each stakeholder's role is will help in the planning process. And like any aviation project, today's discussion will highlight that planning is a necessary step to introduce advanced air mobility into your community. Today's speakers will discuss some examples of that planning process. And we hope that the city, regional, and state planners who are considering bringing AAM to their communities can use this meeting to better understand things you may need to consider and factor into your plans. And now I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. Starting with Sean Kazika, Sean is the Acting Deputy Director for Portfolio Management and Technology Development in, in the FAA Office of NextGen. Sean will give us a short overview on advanced air mobility airspace integration. Kevin Tebow is the Chief Executive Officer of the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority and will speak to the advanced air mobility planning at GOA. Phil Brady is the Partnerships and Acquisitions Manager at Skyports. Phil will share the perspective of an off-airport vertiport developer and important considerations for communities. Melissa Smith is Chief of Modal Development with the Florida Department of Transportation. Melissa will share the extensive work FDOT has done preparing for the deployment of advanced air mobility across Florida. Jason Larazon is Assistant Professor of Aeronautics at Kent State University. Jason will speak to developing Ohio's drone transportation infrastructure and leading Ohio aerospace into the future. Scott Stoffman is Director of Government Affairs at the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International, or AUVSI. Scott will speak to the AUVSI AAM Prepared Campaign, focused on ensuring states and localities are prepared for the future of aviation and are enabling the integration of AAM in their communities. So before we get to the panel, first up, Sean Kaziker is gonna cover AAM airspace integration. Welcome, Sean. Thanks, Colleen. Hello, everybody. Sean Kozika. I'm an Acting Deputy Director here in the Office of NextGen. And part of our role in the Office of NextGen is we're serving as the FAA's overall integration lead for advanced air mobility. What that means is aligning the various planning and strategic uh, alignment activities uh, needed to operationalize advanced air mobility across the FAA. Now I'm going to talk to you about integrating AAM operations into the nation's airspace. Our current outlook for advanced, initial advanced air mobility operations mostly revolves around the utilization of electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, also referred to as eVTOL. These eVTOL aircraft will undergo certification through the FAA's existing processes with numerous manufacturers already advancing their aircraft through these processes now. What we're seeing is from an industry perspective, initial AAM operations are poised to operate primarily to and from large hub airports situated, situated in major metropolitan areas. We're seeing these large airports and urban centers demonstrating the most interest in AAM and are actively collaborating with AAM companies to kickstart operations. It's important to emphasize that the decision to adopt AAM operations and the purposes they'll serve are within their purview of the local communities. As such, the FAA will continue to collaborate closely with the industry stakeholders to align our integration efforts with the areas where communities and operators exhibit the greatest interest in AAM. In terms of infrastructure, most AAM aircraft are expected to operate from vertiports. Initially, these vertiports may be integrated into existing airport facilities to support initial use cases at those airports and large urban areas. 
Vertical ports could also be developed as standalone facilities, either publicly or privately owned. We're seeing interest from a variety of stakeholders in potential vertical port locations. Again, this is a community decision. From an airspace management perspective, the FAA is monitoring several key factors that will signal a readiness for more detailed discussions on airspace integration at specific locations. These factors include interest from airport authorities or landowners, interest from one or more advanced air mobility operators, availability of aircraft, partnerships with other operators, and preliminary route planning. Once these factors start to align at a particular site, the FAA team may seek to engage in more detailed discussions with local stakeholders regarding site-specific airspace integration. Based on site-specific readiness factors, the FAA team may also discuss potential options the airport or landowner may find valuable in refining their plans, such as tabletop exercises supported by the FAA. The FAA also has significant modeling and simulation capabilities that may be used at sites that are determined to have mature AEM plans and a high level of site readiness. Our headquarters team will collaborate closely with the nine regional administrators, leveraging their strong relationships with local stakeholders to assess readiness across the regions. Additionally, the regional administrators can always serve as the initial point of contact for stakeholders interested in exploring AM operations within their respective regions. Initially, advanced air mobility aircraft are expected to operate within and around large metropolitan areas. It's important to recognize the larger operating environment AAM aircraft will enter as they begin service. AAM operations will be incrementally integrated into a bustling, complex, and expanding national airspace system, which already hosts a diverse array of users. Some of these users include legacy air carriers, general aviation, business aviation, commercial space operators, military operations, cargo operations, and lots of different unmanned aircraft systems serving various missions, all with different aircraft types, different performance characteristics, and different mission requirements. For the initial phase of AAM operations, we'll use the existing regulatory framework and operating rules. As previously mentioned, industry plans point towards the initiation of operations in and around major metropolitan areas. These areas are typically categorized by Class B and Class C, also known as Class Bravo and Class Charlie, airspace designations, owing to the high volume and complexity of aviation activities around those areas. Consequently, this airspace imposes some of the most stringent operating requirements. In terms of altitude, AAM aircraft are projected to operate at heights of up to 4,000 feet above the surface. This altitude range ensures compatibility with existing airspace structures and facilitates safe integration with other airspace users. Air traffic controllers will manage initial advanced air mobility operations by providing air traffic control services based on the type of airspace and type of aircraft being operated, just like they do for other airspace users today. These initial AAM operations are planned to have a pilot on board and are expected to operate under visual flight rules. Under visual flight rules, the responsibility for terrain avoidance and deconfliction with other aircraft primarily lies with the pilot, with the controllers mostly providing advisory services, which affords some greater operational flexibility. Operations in Class B and Class C airspace still require some air traffic control provided separation services. Controls will utilize current air traffic control systems and technologies to support AAM operations. As these operations begin to expand and scale, meaning increased volume, additional locations, and more operators utilizing diverse aircraft, the FAA will evaluate what further steps and investments may be necessary to facilitate the continued incremental integration of AAM operations into the national airspace system. The creation of new flight routes specifically for advanced air mobility operations is not expected in the initial phase. While the FAA is always exploring the concept of airspace corridors as part of its operational framework, it is unlikely to be implemented before 2028. Instead, during the initial stages, we plan to utilize the existing low altitude 
visual flight rules route structure to support AAM operations. Most large metropolitan areas, particularly those with Class B airspace, already have established visual routes that are chartered for use by visual flight rules aircraft transitioning to, through, and from the airspace. Due to the high volume of air traffic, route planning will be an extremely important factor in how AAM operations integrate with existing operations at an airport. AAM aircraft may also have unique operating characteristics, much different than the typical commercial airliners that operate the bulk of traffic, which will provide additional integration challenges. Many of those challenges will come down to site-specific airport, airspace, and traffic pattern configurations. Furthermore, the National Airspace System already possesses additional tools for routing aircraft, which we will leverage as necessary as AAM operations continue to expand and scale. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Now I'd like to introduce you to Kevin Tebow, the Chief Executive at the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority. Kevin? Thank you, Sean, and good day, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I wanted to just give you a little bit of an update what's going on at the airport level, uh, especially here in Orlando. So with that, if you go to the next slide, just to level set everyone, here at, uh, at the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority, we are responsible for the operation and management of two airports. The first is Orlando International Airport, also known as MCO. It is the uh, busiest airport here in the state of Florida. It has uh, close to 58 million annual passengers. And as you see here, it provides a tremendous amount of economic benefit to the community. Uh, over $41 billion annually, as well as creating a number of job opportunities, both in supported and, you know, in uh, direct and indirect. But we're also responsible with the oversight of Orlando Executive Airport as well, which is the FAA designated primary reliever for Orlando International. And as you can see here, it also provides a significant economic input to the local community, close to a little over half a billion dollars with again, over 4,000 jobs supported by these two location at that location. So again, quite a bit of economic benefit provided by both airports here in the greater Orlando area. Next slide. So our vision for advanced air mobility really starts with our strategic plan, which was just recently updated by our board uh, last September. And it gives us again, a guidebook and how we plan to move uh, people and sometimes in some areas, goods, cargo, in and out of our airport uh, properties. And it really begins with our direction. And this is our mission, vision, and values. I just wanted to focus on a couple of things real quick. You can see here that our mission is seamlessly connecting Florida through and the world through exceptional experiences, collaboration, and creativity. So we recognize as we've continued to grow here in Orlando, our, uh, our connectivity with Brightline here in the trains and so on has really caused us to evolve as more of a modal hub for the state. But more importantly, what we aspire to be in our vision is a truly important and more relevant here as we talk about advanced air mobility in that we wanna be the global leader in the evolution of mobility. So wherever that evolution takes us, the Great Orlando Aviation Authority is positioning itself to be a part of that discussion. And clearly that uh, does cover what we're talking about here today in the advanced air mobility discussion. So next slide. When we do implement our strategic plan, there are four strategic priorities that are truly our blueprint for the future. And it's focused on people, connection, community, and innovation. And if you think about the conversation we're having here today, we're pretty much touching every one of those priorities, whether it be about moving of people uh, in and around the area to having uh, more robust connections. So where people who travel to Orlando, for example, from either a domestic or international flight, they have this extra opportunity to connect to their final destination, whether here in Orlando it is to our downtown area or to our theme parks or elsewhere, they have that ability to do that. And it's about recognizing that we're, again, a huge economic impact to the community. And so when this advanced air mobility is looking for deployment beyond the connection aspect we just talked about, how what more benefit can we get out of this through our community? And clearly, AAM and eVTOL, as uh, Sean was mentioning just previously, 
uh, has a lot of technology and innovation built into it. So again, this again lines really well with our strategic plan. Next slide. So when we looked at our footprint here at Orlando International Airport, we are blessed with size here at this airport. A lot of people don't realize that we have close to 12,000 acres available to us here at MCO, one of the largest in the country. And so in developing uh, the outlook of where uh, advanced air mobility could reside here at this airport, we developed two preferred visions, a vision A and a vision B, which we'll kind of elaborate here in a moment. But again, reflective of the, the size that we have and our ability to do more than just a vertiport if the uh, opportunity comes uh, our way. So next slide. So in Vision A, you know, we look at this location in our East Airfield as really an opportunity to leverage that property up there. We have well over a thousand acres located in that northeast corner of our property that is reserved for, for this type of a development. And uh, as seen here in this rendering, a lot of planning work has been developed. The roadway network you see there actually was included in some of our early planning efforts and development uh, efforts, coordinating with the local government here, whether it be Orange County or the city of Orlando. So all we're doing is now being able to do that overlay of what this could be. And again, could be a technology incubator. It could be an opportunity to look at how we can uh, research and development, maintenance and repair. A lot of different things could occur at this remote site. But clearly, there's always challenges, right? Just like in any location, and you can see here, you know, clearly, how do we connect this to the main terminal? Um, as you look back at the previous map, uh, the passenger overall, you know, experience, what could be there for them, and you know, how do we do that remote baggage collection? Uh, even though there are some concepts uh, available to us to do that. Next slide. And so the one thing that attracted us to the East Airfield beyond the, the fact of the property size that we have is the flow into and out of Orlando International. As Sean was mentioning, um, OIA or MCO is a Bravo class Bravo airspace. And so as such, uh, as you can see here from this diagram, our North flow and our South flow actually works quite well um, around that property site. And so it should be a very good support mechanism for the development of the site, should that be where it ends up uh, locating as one of those visions that we have for the property. Next slide. But, you know, vision B is the sometimes you've got to crawl before you walk and before you run. And so in this case here, um, this rendering is an attempt to show you uh, the ability to actually provide a vertiport connection in a multimodal setting. So these three vertiports here located here are actually connected to the MCO train station that is adjacent to our new Terminal C just off the, the picture here. And so what this then provides is that seamless connection. So someone should arrive by air, national, international. If someone should arrive by train, whether it be a South Florida train or in the future expansion of this train to uh, Tampa Bay, or even um, some other locations like that, we have the ability to be able to do that with this location and seamlessly be able to provide that connectivity. But same thing occurs about the passenger experience and about the baggage handling, got to work through some of those issues, especially at an airport location. Next slide. And so what we've done is, you know, started uh, last year actually with a lot of robust community outreach and connectivity and activities. So we've started at some different hierarchy levels. We briefed our adjacent uh, homeowners association uh, where Orlando and Nashville is located is next to a very large community called Lake Nona, um, almost as large as uh, MCO is. And so we briefed with a lot of their leadership to talk about not only what's going on at the airport, but more importantly, how advanced air mobility could be a part of that overall discussion. And then uh, we've taken that show on the road and actually presented some other concepts to other community groups, as well as other homeowners associations within the uh, area. And as always, we continue to coordinate with our local elected officials, whether at the city or the county level. Many people don't realize that uh, both Orlando International as well as Orlando Executive are actually city assets, city of Orlando assets. 
So we continue to coordinate with that staff uh, as well, as well as coordinating, and you'll hear soon from Melissa, with our partners at the Florida Department of Transportation and a lot of the work that they've done and done over the last year and a half or so, or even two years. And there, we're a part of their advisory committee group there and continue to engage at a whole bunch of different levels uh, nationally as well. Next slide. So with that, thank you very much. And I believe I will pass this on to Philip. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, my name is Philip Brady. I am the Partnerships and Acquisitions Manager for Skyport Infrastructure. We're based out of London and build Vertiport infrastructure for advanced air mobility across the globe. Um, my hope for today is that y'all will take away considerations for your community. Um, when a Skyport or another Vertiport developer comes to your community, my hope is that my presentation will make you smaller, uh, smarter, give you things to think about that apply to your specific community and also give you next steps uh, for how you can prepare for this industry. Um, so this is about off airport vertiport development, which does differ greatly to a lot of the processes and considerations that Kevin and the Goa folks go through when implementing this at an airport. Uh, next slide, please. So what you see here is a rather large footprint of what a, a massive vertiport could look like. Um, this is kind of our 101 example to give people a sense of what's included in a vertiport. You've got the landing pads. If the site is large enough, you can have a bypass um, similar to airports, which allows for higher um, volume. And then you also have the traditional passenger experience, drop off, pick up and terminal. Um, Passenger value proposition is time savings. And so efficiency uh, is important in moving passengers through our vertiport onto their plane and ultimately to their final destination. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to um, walk through is, is really two stages of our uh, site evaluation and acquisition process that are similar, um, but one's more of a high level 30,000 foot view with the other, uh, uh, taking a, a sharper pencil to dig deeper and ultimately determine whether the business model for that specific site uh, is worth pursuing. Next slide. So when you look at entering a region and for advanced air mobility, you need to look and think about building infrastructure from a regional context because you need places to fly. And again, the value proposition needs to connect people, you know, from a town to, you know, suburban town to a, a urban core or one urban core to another urban core. So, you know, we, we consider design operations of the vertiport. Um, what does the airspace look like in the area? Constructability, uh, capital cost of construction for net new infrastructure, especially with the supply and chain uh, implications today are, are not insignificant. Um, then local stakeholders. Advanced air mobility is different than traditional aviation in, in that the vertiports will serve the local community. Uh, that it is in and therefore needs to mesh into the fabric of that community. And it's largely on the Vertiport developer to identify from a Skyport's perspective, at least, how to ensure that our operations, our designs, um, you know, it, it, you know are, are not negatively impacting the residents, but, but a value proposition to the community because these Vertiports need to have lasting power and, and uh, longevity. And then ultimately the regulatory and permitting review process um, for an off airport vertiport. We start with local permitting. And uh, once we do that, we go to the FAA. And once we have FAA approvals, then work with the state to get our operating permits. Um, and, and ultimately from a high level review, you know, we, we get outputs from each of these uh, areas and ultimately um, plug it into the business case to see if if a given site, whether that's at grade on top of an existing building or in a potentially new development, um, would pencil. And, and at which point we engage with the landlord to start educating them on the industry and getting them comfortable with this new modality and, and you know, the potential positive, but also risk profile of, um, of including it in their development. Next slide, please. So assuming we get the business model to pencil 
and that the landlord, private or public, right, because we could do a P3 uh, or respond to an RFP from a community, um, assuming that we get the landlord on board, you know, we will typically sign a uh, memorandum of, of understanding or, or some type of legal framework document that gives both Skyports and the landlord, um, you know, the parameters from which we continue due diligence and the protection, you know, so so when we go out and spend additional capital to bring in experts to to question and and, and validate our findings, um, you know, we are protected. So at, at Skyports, we do all of our initial and even deep dive due diligence internally. We have a vertiport planning team, electrification team that fo focus on fo focuses on you know microgrid upgrades and working with utility companies. We uh, we have an airspace team that's focused um, really on the flight pass into and out of our aerodrome. So that that is a very short flight path again into and out of our aerodrome. Um, and, and then we look at, you know, the complexity of the local airspace, because whether it's class Bravo or, or Charlie or Delta, um, we need to understand, you know, what, what the local airport's doing, um, what sensitive, you know, sites, government or schools may be in the area, what existing rotocraft and drone um, operations are going on because airspace is complex. The FAA is taking the lead on that, but we need to understand and design flight paths in and out of our vertiports that also protect our vertiport from future development. Um, also, you know, ensure that the, the, the flight paths in and out of our vertiport don't allow operators to fly over residential neighborhoods. We oftentimes will find a fantastic site that checks a lot of the boxes. But if we can't ensure that our vertiport meshes to the fabric of the community and does not take away from the quality of life of the residents, then we will not build or proceed with a site. Um, so from a, a vertiport planning and design standpoint, you know, airspace is definitely into, again, into and out of our vertiport, an important one. Um, that helps us understand volume um, and then can allow us from a designing standpoint you know, to figure out how many turns an hour our vertiport will receive and ultimately what the business model would look like. Uh, capacity and demand then, you know, layers on uh, again, uh, you know, more information into the business model, which helps us understand what that landing fee will look like. This is a global race, advanced air mobility. It's, it's like attracting an F1 team or a race to your city. So, um, you know, every region we go to, we, we, we have to be honest, you're competing on a global scale. So we need to make sure the business model is as attractive as possible to uh, warrant an, uh, an, an operator, you know, coming into that market and choosing that market over another market. Um, but that is if as a community, you are trying to be a first mover. And there are pros and cons that go with being a first mover. Uh, state and local environmental requirements are a really interesting one and, and off, oftentimes uh, can preclude early adoption. CEQA is a state environmental review process that complicates all types of business development um, and, and therefore can make the risk profile for private development um, you know, much more difficult and, and therefore a profile that just doesn't wa warrant day one investment and time because there's easier markets potentially to go to. Um, also understanding nimbyism, you know, not in my backyard. If communities don't want this, they won't have it. And that's OK. It's you know, we're in a we're in a country that allows you to make those decisions. The Georgetown, the suburb of Washington, D.C., decided they never wanted a metro or didn't want a metro back in the 70s. And today they don't have a metro. So understanding what the local community wants, what their willingness to adopt new technology is. And frankly, if if they just aren't receptive to new industry, um, can can also determine whether or not private industry will from day one spend time trying to launch this this infrastructure and this industry. Um, and then ultimately, you know, we do our best to input, you know, as close to real numbers as possible to the business model and, and then work with our landlord partners to understand the risk profiles for Skyports for them. And and then ideally try to to sign a, a lease agreement that allows us to go to market and attract a, a vehicle operator. Next slide, please.
So lastly, I, I want to leave you with some thoughts and, and ultimately suggestions on what you can do as a community. Vertiports serve the local community and they must integrate seamlessly into the fabric of your community. If a Vertiport operator comes to y'all to build a Vertiport and they suggest flight pass in and out that, you know, on land off and take take off and landing, you know, fly over residential neighborhoods, ask them to rethink it. Um, because when they stand up in front of the community, you know, six months down the line, uh, it's going to be a very hard argument to make, and it should never be an argument. It should be, um, you know, a, a story as to how you're going to benefit the community that that vertiport is going to actually serve the local community. Um, conditional use from a zoning standpoint allows for flexibility. If the FAA reauth is passed as it written today, then uh, a, a vertiport will be a subset of a heliport. Every built environment across the country, whether the town is small or large, is different. And so be careful about prescribing Vertiport as a as a, a use case under a commercial or an industrial or residential, um, because you just need you, you need to almost put the onus on the Vertiport developers to look at the community try to figure out where the value proposition and the existing infrastructure allows for a vertiport and then make the case as to why y'all should give you know a skyport or another vertiport developer the option to build uh pre-construction costs are extremely expensive and um you know trying to reduce those whether it's through subsidies or grants or whatnot can help make an attractive landing fee it's okay to be a second third or fourth tier market from an onboarding perspective oftentimes first movers there is an upside but there's also a risk to that right so sometimes learning from best practices can be very very positive for your community and there's nothing wrong with doing things right and taking a slow approach so you know you are not at risk and and you build a vertiport for day one operations that has long serving benefits to the community um, and then identifying your role in the region. You might need a big vertiport. You might need a, a, a FATO that operates as a landing pad and a gate. You may supply MRO facilities or overnight hangarage. So take that kind of internal look and see where you think you fit in and where you can take advantage for your community of this new industry. Um, and then ultimately, your community may not want a vertiport. So if as a political stakeholder, you think it's needed, start working on outreach and education. Um, what you can do today is educate the community, educate the utility providers. Um, building support through workforce development is a great way to get community buy-in, but also workforce needs to be local, which is a fantastic component of this new industry. So trying to figure out how you can create internships or STEM programs, you know, maybe in the early middle schools that go through high school and, and to, to, to local vocational programming, programs uh, is a great way to start thinking about how to get your community ready for this industry. There's plenty of money uh, for the Build Back Better plan on electrification upgrades and, and things like that, and even uh, grants to study advanced air mobility. So start trying to identify those grants and, and potentially try to write grants for that. Um, and then action over talk. There's plenty of work to do today. The industry has a lot of questions that we need to answer, and we're working with you know, the FAA and and other stakeholders to provide those answers, but there is work. So start prepping by educating, thinking about zoning and how you could integrate your town and community into this broader AAM industry. So I, I will leave you with this. Um, if I hopefully, you know, send an idea or, or there is a, a topic you'd like to dig into further, please reach out to me. Um, it is important that AAM is adopted uh, correctly across the United States. Um, so I hope this was beneficial and look forward to hopefully hearing from, from y'all you know, in the future. On that note, um, I will pass this off to Melissa Smith from FDOT. Perfect. Thank you, Philip. Good afternoon. I am Melissa Smith, the Chief of Modal Development for the Florida Department of Transportation. And today I'm excited to share with you the great work the Florida Department of Transportation has been doing in emerging technology surrounding advanced air mobility. In 2022, FDOT launched the Advanced Air Mobility Working Group to engage industry leaders, aviation experts, representatives from all levels of government, and multimodal partners across the state 
Today, I'll be taking you through what benefits can be achieved through AAM, what we've done here in Florida, and what is left ahead of us as we prepare to take flight with AAM in the Sunshine State. Next slide. Generally, as we discuss AAM, we tend to think of the personal transportation aspect. However, this technology has a number of uses that will prove to ease congestion and increase supply chain resiliency. These vehicles will have the ability to deliver medical goods, household items, and time-sensitive cargo. The applications in public service have yet to be fully realized, but are anticipated to aid first responders with life-saving search and rescue, disaster relief, and air ambulance operations. Next slide. Florida DOT took a leading role in preparing the state of Florida for AAM. Beginning efforts in December of 2021 and establishing an AAM working group in 2022. Composed of 50 stakeholders from various agencies, the FAA, OEMs, local governments, and other industry stakeholders. The working group produced several documents to guide officials at all levels with what may lie ahead for this industry's development in Florida. This foundational work is being continued by the AAM Advisory Committee that officially took the reins from the working group last November. Next slide. One of the products produced by the working group is an implementation plan. The implementation plan walks through regulatory, legislative, and community outreach items that should be undertaken as the AAM landscape continues to mature in Florida. Phase one includes stakeholder outreach and education. Elements of the FDOT's public outreach plan include hosting tabletop exercises, enhancing the FDOT AAM website, and workshops with local decision makers to educate them about AAM. Phase two includes public education campaigns and community outreach to engage the public and increase public awareness of this emerging technology. As you can see, with two phases of our plan centered on our communities, community engagement is very important. As with any new technology, understanding and acceptance goes a long way as policymakers at all levels of government continue to produce a helpful framework for AAM to be successful within each unique community across Florida. We have provided a multitude of resources to ensure the implementation is done safely, efficiently, and with citizens of our state at the forefront. Phase three includes full integration into Florida's robust transportation network increasing our supply chain resiliency and diversifying our multimodal system. Next slide. Earlier this month, the Florida DOT emphasized our dedication to AAM by bringing together key industry partners and public and private sector stakeholders to discuss the integration of AAM into Florida's transportation network and perform the first of three tabletop exercises. Florida DOT partnered with the Hillsborough County Aviation Authority to host the tabletop exercise at Tampa International Airport. This tabletop exercise included local government officials, stakeholders, and community and industry leaders to further identify needs, discuss challenges, streamline processes, and develop necessary infrastructure to begin AAM services in the Sunshine State. Discussions included the types of AAM operations, how AAM differs from traditional aviation, necessary landing infrastructure, and how local officials and community leaders can best plan for these in their communities. AAM is a truly emerging industry across the country. In Florida, FDOT and the advisory committee take great pride in bringing all stakeholders to the table to ask questions about the future of this industry, to determine if AAM is right for their community and how it may impact their residents and visitors. The continued collaboration and open dialogue have been admired by many other states as the gold standard for making this new technology a reality. Following the series of our planned tabletop exercises and with additional feedback from the advisory committee, the Florida AAM Land Use and Site Approval Guidebook is slated to be released this summer. The guidebook will assist local planners, elected officials, and industry leaders to make informed decisions about AAM and communities throughout Florida, including land use and approval processes for these operations. Next slide. As with any emerging technology, it's important to understand jurisdictional roles and responsibilities. For AAM, these jurisdictional roles are broken down by federal, state, local government, and airport. At the federal level, responsibility includes certification of aircraft, standards for vertiports, airspace and air traffic control, pilot operator regulations, and safety and compliance. For the state, the FDOT Aviation Office continues statewide AAM coordination, standards of vertiports and site approvals and inspections. 
local governments continue the responsibility of zoning protection, land use compatibility, and community engagement. To our airports falls the responsibility of FAA compliance, airport rules and regulations, and adhering to minimum standards. Next slide. Communities are the heart of everything we do at the Florida DOT. The opportunity that AAM market creates for a thriving state like Florida not only capitalizes on emerging technologies, but reinforces our commitment to a robust multimodal transportation system. Thank you again for the opportunity to highlight this exciting work being undertaken by the Florida DOT and for being partners with us as we continue this conversation to bring AAM transportation into reality. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jason Lorenzen. He's professor of aeronautics at Kent State University. Thank you so much, <laughs> Melissa. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm gonna be talking about what's going on in Ohio and more specifically what the uh, governor's office is doing how that's translated into the to the different government agencies here in Ohio, influencing industry. And uh, one of the big things I'll be talking about is what Kent State's doing uh, for workforce development. Next slide, please. As I just mentioned, Ohio's approach, there is um, a policy that's set forth by the governor's office, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Um, retired Colonel Joe Zies is the governor's advisor on aeronautics and aerospace here in Ohio, and he really does a very good job uh, to do a public outreach with the different stakeholders here in Ohio, communicating what the desires of the governor, governor's office is throughout the state. Um, which is actually spurring innovation development through the different government agencies. But I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, one of the projects that I've been involved with, with the Ohio Department of Transportation, involving the different establishment of infrastructure and use cases. Biggest component is the third one that I'll be talking about is here at Kent State, what we're doing in research and workforce development. We are a R1 uh, rated university. And uh, we are also an FAA UAS CTI school, as well as being an ATC um, CTI school. Uh, we have a UAS operations, a Bachelor of Science degree. And although we had an ATC, we still have the ATC degree, but we've added a, an extra component um, called airspace management. So it's air traffic and airspace management, Bachelor of Science degree. And we have different uh, graduate degrees that are currently in development. We also have three-day Part 107 workshops that are offered to the general public. And uh, we take part in Drone Day, which is a community outreach this year. It's uh, uh, set forth by the FAA and it's April 27th. We'll be having a two hour session here at our airport, introducing the community to what part 107 is, what safe drone operations are, and trying to encourage many people, especially those who are certificated pilots already, to get their part 107 if you're not, to sign up for a part 107 workshop. We also are current recipient or recent recipient of an aviation workforce development grant from the FAA, where we're going to be both focusing on, um, on UAS, advanced air mobility, as well as uh, fixed wing uh, pilots uh, using virtual reality, alternative reality, and training the trainer to go back to the high schools, uh, especially STEM high schools, to create hopefully a, a good foundation for our future. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the governor has been, uh, Governor Mike DeWine's office has been very instrumental in what's been going on here in Ohio by their overarching policy. And largely it's due to our history here in Ohio. Um, you know, Ohioans, we, we, you know, we really led with Orville and Wilbur Wright uh, back over a hundred years ago with the development of the airplane. Um, going to aerospace, going to different airlines like Eddie Rickenbacker, uh, NASA, uh, different uh, and different manufacturers, different industry, along with the different universities and, and aerospace research centers here uh, in, in Ohio. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this is the big uh, four pillars of Governor DeWine's uh, um, aerospace and defense pillars. First is to preserve, protect, defend, and expand the federal aerospace and defense installations. Think of the uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base down in the Dayton area. And that's just one of, of, of several major, uh, major installations that the governor wants to preserve. Big issue that I'm involved in here, a big, uh, big uh, policy movements to increase the reach 
re research portfolio and statewide synergies of Ohio's national level uh, laboratories. Um, working also, the third pillar, working with Jobs Ohio to preserve and expand Ohio's aerospace and defense industry and aggressively attract jobs, mission, and companies to Ohio, which has largely been working. Um, Intel is now outside of Columbus, as well as um, Joby now near the Dayton, uh, Cincinnati area. And the big thing, of course, is the fourth pillar that I'm involved in outside of the uh, research is maintain and grow the workforce. Um, as an assistant professor, I'm also head of the um, UAS program here at Kent State. You know, how do we create that next generation of workforce that are going to be ready, willing, and able to fit those jobs, that industry, and that the consumers will be demanding in the future? And we're working very carefully with different institutions throughout the state, with high schools, with different also institutions. I'll mention uh, USI Unmanned Safety Institute and census systems to educate our students on what those different platforms are going to be that will be flying in the national airspace system. Next slide, please. Why Ohio is important. One of the big things that has always amazed me about Ohio is that 90% of the United States lives within 500 miles of Columbus, Ohio. Columbus is designated as a smart city, uh, centralized to, uh, in our center uh, of Ohio, down towards the Southwest area. We have Cincinnati, Dayton, University of Dayton, University of Cincinnati, Wright State University, Wright Pat Air Force Base. We also have the um, national Advanced Air Mobility Center of Excellence that's in Springfield, where a lot of companies use that as a test bed uh, designated by the FAA. And to the northeast part in my neck of the woods here in Ohio, we have you know Kent State University, uh, Cleveland State, Case Western, University of Akron, University of Youngstown, and also very major component is the uh, NASA John Glenn Center. And you know, with all these synergies with industry, creates a pretty good fertile uh, fertile area for the development of advanced air mobility. Next slide, please. One of the things I've been involved with um, and certainly spurred off partly fr from the governor's policy was that what the UAS low level altitude system will look like in Ohio. Um, it's definitely an apparatus that will help develop Ohio's XTM. My particular job in this was to help develop a legislative roadmap for the Ohio legislature. Um, I won't get into the actual nuts and bolts of the system, but again, it's coming up with a, a low-level altitude surveillance system, and, and the Cal Analytics is, is one of the big players in this, and we'll see a slide here coming up of what they're working on. But one of the big things that my team here at Kent State and the team that I was working on, we came up with one of the big things that we, we were telling local and state uh, agencies and governments that any legislation at the state level or local level has to be carefully crafted and harmonized with the FAA, with the federal laws and regulations. And that really is one of the big challenges. But again, with, with um, you know, public outreach, um, this is one huge area uh, that, that needs to be considered. Next slide, please. Cal Alex, as I, as I mentioned, was involved with him on the study, paving the way for, for advanced air mobility operations. And in that, which is very interesting, came up this air, air, airspace surveillance system. And in that, um, there's, you know, using the ADSB network that's already there, FAR radar free, feeds, track and fusion services, and what does that airspace management look like? And of course, the health and integrity of the system itself. And which pays away for one major use case that was just announced a few weeks ago using this system. Next slide, please. Was uh, operations around US Route 33, again, scaling up one of the stepping stones in advanced air mobility. Um, drones will assist in traffic management and emergency responses along Route 33 in areas where there aren't, aren't cameras. And it's a four-year project to integrate drone technology into statewide traffic systems, of course, with the major goal of improving safety and efficiency, which I think is also a major part of uh, the attractiveness to public outreach. Public will, in, will uh, appreciate improved safety and efficiency if they see the benefits of this new technology. Next slide. And FAA has approved the Beyond Visual Line of Sight drone test 
Um, they're actually going to be using a census Centero drone, which uh, proud to announce that we're actually going to be receiving uh, one of their command control and communication systems and one of their drones, same drone that's being used in this, so that we can train our students to know what this technology uh, is and they'll be proficient at it. Next slide, please. Our students themselves here at Kent State, we have a Center of Advanced Air Mobility. Uh, that's really one of our major outreaches, not only to the community, but to industry. We are working with other universities and communities. Um, we have law and policy initiatives. We have Drone Innovation, which is a yearly symposium in mid-November. Last year, we had um, uh, Alessio Constantini, a major law firm. Uh, it's part of a major law firm in Rome that helped with the certification of the um, Velocity drone that's being used in Rome and eventually um, in Paris. Um, we have, of course, our undergraduate uh, degree programs. And one of the other things that I'm really proud to, to, to mention here is our um, students were part of a um, uh, another Ohio Department of Transportation project called the uh, part of the Vertiport Challenge, where they were dealing with uh, the greening uh, of the airspace over Akron. And they were involved with developing what the Vertiport and what the power, the solar system would look like to supply the power for future drone operations. And largely that is um, a, a pretty much an overview of the, of the three different areas I wanted to talk to you about. And if you have any questions, we can go to the last slide. There'll be my contact information. And uh, I'd like to introduce to you um, uh, Scott Stoffman, uh, who'll be um, talking about um, the work of AUVSI. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Scott Stoffman. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International, or AUVSI. We are the largest nonprofit dedicated to the advancement of autonomous robotic and uncrewed systems. We've got members from small to large in the civil and defense space, as well as on the government connected side. And so I specifically work on the state level and federal level advocacy, and we develop educational programs and uh, model legislation that we've worked with our industry members on to help further those interests of industry, as well as taking into account what are state and local concerns, what are federal concerns, how do we get constituents to be part of that discussion, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about AAM Prepared, which is our specific state campaign for advanced air mobility. Next slide, please. So in development of this program, we saw a strong need and a, a strong block of original equipment manufacturers and infrastructure providers, some of which you've heard from here today or seen in some of the pictures in some of these presentations. We wanted to try and say, how can we centralize? How can we reduce some of the confusion that people have around advanced air mobility? and get ready for what the future potentially holds for us, right? So part of that discussion was working with our members, getting together the basic plan, and then moving forward with it while we're also then talking with states and cities to understand what are their needs? What can they be doing around things like planning and zoning? How are their current transportation planning and funding already happening? And how can we make something that fits very well with that and doesn't really jam up with it, right? Then what we wanted to do was understand as an industry, we don't want to hold up our hands and say, please don't regulate us. This is too early. We're a new technology. No, we wanted to give them a base to work from. And that's what AAM Prepared is. We wanted to set up those sort of initial steps and things that will move and grow with the industry, that will move and grow with those use cases and the uptake and the demand. And we launched the campaign itself in late December of 2023. We reached out across all 50 states to relevant lawmakers, to relevant stakeholders, as well as working closely with our members and doing outreach like this, speaking to the Advanced Air Mobility Interagency Working Group, speaking through our chapters that are based around the country, and really just making sure that there's some sort of out, for, out forward engagement happening. And we also realize that it's important to understand how can we dispel sort of misconceptions around what AAM is, how it's going to integrate with other aircraft that, and other users of the national airspace system, and all of that's part of what we pulled together with AAM Prepared. Now I'm going to talk about the actual nuts and bolts of the campaign itself. Next slide, please. The first piece that we pulled together is this legislative database. So uh, our team really does a really good job of tracking and assessing anything from a legislative standpoint that's either been proposed or is in process or has been passed. We wanted to give lawmakers and the public an easy place to go and look to see what are the things about advanced air mobility that might be legislated that have been talked about 
and give you a quick idea of if something was either favorable or unfavorable in our view, as well as with some of that input from our members. So this is an easy place to go and understand sort of what does the landscape look like from a legislative perspective and how can we then build off of the good work that's already been done or potentially avoid some of the pitfalls that have popped up in some of these early legislative proposals. Next slide, please. The other thing that we've recognized is a lot of states are already interested. You've heard from some here that are really the leaders in this space about advanced term mobility. They pulled together state study committees, and that's bringing in the, the right stakeholders, both inside the lawmaking side, as well as stakeholders inside departments of transportation, departments of aviation, or also working very closely with industry as partners. You know, there's a lot of time, a lot of brain power, and a lot of work being done by these states. And a lot of good reports have already been pulled together. So what we wanted to do with this report compendium is take a really close look at all of those reports, pull out the important things that you should know, and get a set of what we think are really strong pillars that can be relied upon by those states that want to keep moving forward with their own efforts and not reinventing the wheel and starting from square one. So I'm gonna talk about what those specific common themes are in the next slide. First of all, we think state investment is important. We realize that there's going to be private investment in this, but it's not gonna be something that's completely shouldered by industry. What that investment's gonna look like will be different across state based on the use cases, based on the demand, and just based on how the industry is developing. You know, And I think it will also change over time as the industry grows, as the appetite for advanced mobility grows as well. We know that workforce development, which has already been mentioned multiple times throughout the presentation, is going to be hugely important. We have a lot of workers already in the space that have a ton of knowledge about traditional aviation. And how can we take them and train them up or train them parallel to work in advanced aviation? And we also need to look at what the future of this workforce looks like. There are a ton of kids that are already interested in drones, in advanced air mobility, that are in high school or even younger that see this as a potential viable career pathway. So how can we work in the curriculum development, in the funding that's happening to get those kids interested and keep them moving up that chain so they can get involved in this industry and the US can keep leading in advanced term mobility. We also want to provide a place where having a state AAM coordinator, whether that's a, an individual person or an office is a viable place and a good center of knowledge for lawmakers, for the public, for industry to go to and say, hey, we're interested in doing this development, or I'm worried about how this is going to impact me or my community. So having a viable central person or office to go talk to is a really important key piece to making sure this development happens and it happens the right way. Uh, number four is the reason that we're here today. That's community outreach, community engagement. That's talking across this whole set of people. You look at this panel, it's really a varied set of interests and opinions that are here trying to talk to the public about what is it that AAM can be? What is it that it will be? What do we want it to be? And so it's really important that that is a two-way discussion. You know, this presentation is only the start. We know that we're going to get outreach, we're going to get questions, and we have to make sure that we rely on that feedback and we give, uh, you know, potential, potential feedback to those that are speaking to us. Fifth, perfect proactive infrastructure investment. You know, this is going to be a new kind of aviation. It's going to be a new way of powering things. We know that electrical grids in states may not be prepared. But the way that we can make sure that they are is already looking at the work that's being done around uh, electric ground, like cars, and you know, think of Tesla, think of charging infrastructure that's already being put in place. There's federal dollars being invested, there's state dollars being invested. So take a little bit of extra assessment of, can we get that high voltage line and drop it across from the street to the airport? Next slide, please. We also know that in our work on the state side, having definitions that are consistent across legislation is very helpful, right? When people say things, especially in new industries, we want to make sure that we're not confused by what it is that they mean. So looking to already existing definitions that are in law is a good place to start. And that's why we have this really easy to refer to piece of legislation, piece of definitions that have been vetted by our members and by industry and by lawmakers. It's an easy place to go to understand what are some of the important definitions that will be useful as you move forward in considering what can be done about AAM. Next slide, please. The final piece of this picture for us is having model legislation. We know it's a good place to open the door. It really takes all of the work that we've done and puts it together in something that's a good start of a discussion. We have these definitions. We have clarity around making sure that we're carving out smaller drones because they're already covered by a very comprehensive set of federal legislations, and they don't need the same kind of infrastructure that advanced air mobility is going to need. So there's not that same crossover at the state and local level when it comes to the powers that exist when state law versus those that exist on the federal side and that are of the purview of the FAA. 
So we want to make sure that we have an easy way to point to something that can start that conversation with lawmakers and stakeholders at the state and local level. And we're already making progress on that. So the next slide talks about a little bit of our interactions that we've had so far, as well as some of the success that we've had so far. We're really happy to have a strong set of partners in Alabama. They've taken up our model legislation. It's passed the House. We've also gotten some budget attached to that that's moving its way through the Senate. And we look forward to seeing the whole thing passed by the end of the session here in a few months. We've also been working really closely in a number of these state study committees that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I myself and my colleague Elizabeth have been working in Texas, Illinois, Utah, as well as we are going to be meeting with a large group of uh, state aviation officials just this next week at Exponential, our conference in San Diego. It's an opportunity for us to really hear the other side of this discussion, not just industry saying, this is what we want done, but also hearing from lawmakers and hearing from those stakeholders about what are the things that are unique about your state, about your economy, about the way that you want to adopt advanced air mobility and the ways that we can help meet those intricacies and tailor the work that we're doing to those different communities. Next slide. So thanks again for taking the time to listen to me. If you have any questions about advanced air mobility, about a and prepared and you want to find out more, our website is a great resource. I'm going to kick it back over to Colleen as we get started on our fireside chat. Thanks so much, Scott. Wow, um, that was a lot of information. Those presentations were really interesting, and I think they demonstrated how every stakeholder brings a different perspective to the conversation. Every one of the folks that spoke have a role in community engagement. So let's transition now to a brief panel discussion. I'd like to introduce some additional FAA staff joining us for the next part of the webinar. Shauna Barry is the Environmental Policy Division Manager in the Office of Environment and Energy. Mike Hines is the Planning and Environmental Division Manager, Office of Planning and Programming in the Office of Airports. And Beth White is a Senior Strategist, Publish, Public and Industry Engagement, Mission Support Services in the Air Traffic Organization. So if I could have everybody on the panel, please turn on your cameras, that would be great. All right, the first question I'd like to ask the panel is, how are decisions being made to bring these services to communities? And before I hand this one off, I know this is a hot topic. Um, I've heard folks ask my team, you know, when is FAA gonna come tell me how I can get AAM into my community or not? Um, so I'd like to ask a variety of folks on the panel to, to talk to this question about decisions and how to bring these services to communities. How are those decisions being made? And Kevin, um, from the Greater Orlando uh, Aviation Authority, could you start us off on that one? Sure, Colleen, but I was gonna ask you, so when is FAA? No, I'm only kidding. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I figured, hey, I go went first, I could be the one to do that, right? So. Um, it has to be a collaboration, right? At the end of the day, I think Philip brought it up a little bit in his presentation about the fact of, you know, the community embracing it or not embracing it. I mean, part of it is coordination, collaboration, uh, doing a lot of outreach, right? And inevitably, when you've got something new like this, and it's a new mode of transportation, let's say, or an opportunity, um, people are, you know, a little hesitant, right? And they're, they're not they're not certain of what it could be. And so again, what we're trying to do is getting information out there as much as we can to the community, understand not only how this could be of a benefit to Orlando, the greater Orlando area, but more importantly, how the airport could be a part of that and um, getting feedback and, and information from a lot of those different participants. Interesting enough, as you go into just like anything else that you've done on any project related, you anticipate what those comments could be. And in most cases, it's in a different direction. And so it, it becomes then great feedback to get to the next level of collaboration. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Melissa from FDOT, what are your thoughts there? Thank you. Yes, I'd echo what Kevin's saying there too when it comes to collaboration. Um, it's important to have these conversations and have a dialogue at all levels because it's going to take all levels for this to come through it and to determine if this 
new mode of transportation is right for your community and what the benefits of it could be to your community and how you can bring that all together. But it requires those decisions at all levels. And to begin that, to get it into your community and start it, um, it's going to have to start those conversations today. So that's why I think it's important to be involved, to watch things such as this one today as well, to learn what other states are doing, what other communities are doing, um, and see how it could best benefit your community for this one. So Scott, what are you seeing from AUVSI? Yeah, thanks. I think the, the important thing for people to understand is that the FAA is a great partner in helping assess whether or not our operation is going to be safe, whether or not it meets the needs of users in a specific market, and whether or not it's going to be a detractor or a helper in, in the airspace, right? It's not up to the FAA to pick winners and losers. It's up to industry and communities to work together to say, hey, we have a specific need for this use case in our community. There's demand for it. There's a business you know, recognition and understanding that AAM is going to be really helpful, whether that's moving people, moving cargo, or, or just providing another service that fits with the existing transportation infrastructure and planning that's already happened. The FAA is one step along that discussion to make sure that it's being done safely and it's going to meet really well with the existing users of that space. So it's it's not really up to the FAA necessarily to bring or not bring AAM to a community. It's up to the community and it's up to the people that are gonna be operating those aircraft in these operations. That's, um, that's, that's really great, Scott, great perspective. So Jason, you talked to us about drones and um, the work that you've been involved in in Ohio. Um, so where, where do you see uh, decisions being made to bring services to communities? Well, well, again, it's going to be definitely at the local level, uh, given, uh, and again, the biggest issue is going to be, and I, I've said this a couple of times, you know, proper public outreach uh, will lead to public acceptance. But I think the biggest issue is what is that consumer demand going to be in the future? And as you know, again, as a stakeholder from the university level, trying to create that next level of aviation professional, we've got to kind of say, okay, what is that consumer demand? Where are our graduates going to be working? Um, which companies are they going to be working with? What services? And what I see developing as this scales up, you know, I'm, I'm working also as a part-time prosecutor uh, in a small village, of, or not a small village, but the village of Richfield here in Ohio, and I've been working with their first responders using drone technology and using UASs for surveillance, uh, not only for surveillance, um, but also different use cases of, of, of finding um finding evidence, et cetera, that they need. And then once the the, the uh, first responders see what the value is of that, then that translates into the public realizing, oh my gosh, there's a huge tangible benefit. And we're working with the different, um, the different uh, agencies here locally, training the police officers, training uh, the fire departments in part 107, what proper drone operations are. And as this scales up, you know, what's that next step going to be? Public will respond very positively to that once they start to see a tangible benefit. Then eventually we're going to see different communities uh, accepting, hey, what is that next step going to be? Uh, and that's that's gonna that that's a, a it's a huge challenge. Um, and I think once uh, once the uh, consumer demand is in place, then I think the the role of the FAA also becomes a little bit easier and clearer of what those next steps are. Okay, great perspectives. So let's pivot to um, vertiports. So I'm gonna ask Mike from our FAA team to kick us off on the answer to this one. Can you provide some insight on how vertiports will be integrated into the NAS? Yeah, great, thanks Colleen. <clears throat> it's great to be here today representing FAA's Office of Airports. And my remarks today are primarily focused on the physical facilities required uh, to accommodate advanced air mobility. And I think you'll see these remarks echo and support what we've already heard for some of our, from some of our presenters. So as we all know, FAA's mission is to provide the safest, most efficient aerospace system in the world. And like any other proposed landing facility, safety is a priority when integrating vertiports into the NAS. To do this, as, Kylie, as Colleen stated in the opening remarks, we need to understand the roles and responsibilities of the federal government and the roles and responsibilities of the local government. The FAA, specifically the Office of Airports, which is where I work, is responsible for providing regulatory oversight in areas of safety, facility planning, environmental analysis, 
and financial assistance at facilities identified in the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, or what we commonly refer to as the NIPIUS. So the NIPIUS includes those facilities that the Secretary considers important to the overall national transportation system, and currently includes 3,247 public use airports, eight public use heliports, and 32 public use seaplane bases. The plan, the plan uh, is updated every two years as directed by Congress. Uh, and the future uh, updates, the future updates of this plan will likely include public use vertiports. So what you also need to, to understand is the NIPIUS is but a small subset of the total number of facilities across the country. And to put this into perspective, there's over 20,000 landing facilities in the U.S., including 13,000 airports, of which approximately 4,800 are public use, and there's over 6,000 heliports, of which 55 are public use. So what does this mean? Why is this important? Well, it means there's a significant number of landing facilities, including over 1,500 public use airports where the FAA has no regulatory oversight. So moving forward, we will see vertiports integrated into, air, in, into airports, including existing public use NIPIUS airports, as we saw uh, with what's happening in Orlando at Orlando International, as well as standalone uh, vertiports, which may or may not uh, be included in the NIPIUS in the future. The proposed vertiports that are in the NIPIUS, either integrated into existing airports or standalone, the FAA will have oversight, including appro approval of the airport or vertiport layout plan. And what this means is that the approval will ensure that the facilities are planned and designed following FAA design standards. So for those facilities where we do not have oversight, this is really where the local government uh, comes in involved. We encourage local and state agencies to adopt FAA design standards. As you know, we have EB 105, which has design standards. Eventually, this will become a vertiport design advisory circular, similar to the airport design advisory circular. And it's really the authoritative source providing an acceptable level of safety for those uh, for these facilities. So we encourage you to uh, be familiar with these uh, with these documents when the advisory circular comes out try to integrate it into your local uh, policies and guidance. And the, the last point that I wanna make, and it really reiterates what, uh, what Melissa uh, from FDOT said, is regardless of our oversight responsibilities, land use compatibility is inherently a local issue. While we absolutely have an interest in land use compatibilities, our authorities are limited. And that even uh, includes uh, NIPIUS airports. We have limited land use compatibility authority. Uh, the FAA has existing guidance, the Airport Land Use Compatibility Planning Advisory Circular that have already developed. You can find it on our website that's absolutely applicable uh, to these facilities. So I encourage you to look at that document uh, for the guidance. Um, and I'll just leave you with, it, it's, uh, you know your communities best. So make sure you're doing the appropriate level of planning, including land use compatibility, designing uh, facilities that meet an acceptable level of safety for the successful integration of advanced air mobility. Back to you, Colleen. Thanks, Mike. That was a mouthful. A um, lot, a lot of good information there. I'm going to ask Scott to weigh in from AUVSI and um, maybe make a connection to the work that you're doing with AAM Prepared. Yeah, thanks, Colleen. I appreciate that. We, we do a lot of work with local governments as well as at the state level. And I think that as Mike mentioned, right, there are a lot of specific local concerns. I, I think Patrick or Philip also mentioned in his presentation, understanding what planning and zoning is going to look like. It'll be different across communities, but the, the best way to really understand and be ready for that is sort of what are the, the minimum un, like standards that we're going to need in place? What existing definitions do we already have in place? There's already infrastructure, like Mike mentioned, around heliports and, and other aviation infrastructure that can be repurposed, that can be scaled up a little bit differently to, to meet these aircraft as well as to understand what is the appetite of the local community to bring in these aircraft, to bring in these new entrants, right? You know, there's a different noise signature for a lot of these electrically powered aircraft than existing helicopters. And so I think that there's going to be a lot of meetings that are going to happen at state and local level, and they're already happening, right? There are a number of states that are leaning in on this. There's a lot of good constituent feedback that's happening. Industry is being very open to reaching out to those communities that they're considering operating in. And we know that it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all uh, operation, but that's why we have educational campaigns like A and Prepared, like Drone Prepared, and understanding where is that nuance and difference between how these aircraft might operate, 
where state and local powers exist and where federal powers exist. So that the FAA is charged with really understanding about the aircraft, about the operations, ensuring safety there. And then it's around planning and zoning for cities to uh, understand the economic needs, to understand the constituent concerns, as, as well as how to best serve their community. So we can't touch on NAS integration without asking our air traffic uh, part of the organization. So I'm going to ask Sean Kazika, if you, could you touch on that question regarding integration of vertiports into the NAS? Yes, I will. Can't forget about the airspace, right? So um, the, the same theme um, of community engagement, early engagement, ongoing dialogue applies here too when it comes to airspace and really helping the communities make informed decisions. Uh, one of those very important decisions is where to build a vertical port. I can you know, assure you that the impacts and considerations of building a vertical port on an existing airport like Orlando is looking at compared to building a brand new vertical port on top of a parking structure like Philip had in his really cool picture, there are very different impacts of those two things. And those need to be considered very much when you're looking at location. You know, some of the factors that come into play um, are where would that location be in proximity to other airports nearby? You know, are you trying to build so build a vertical port that's near a busy airport or even a even a small general aviation airport? You know, that's definitely a consideration. Uh, the the overlying airspace where you're trying to build. What's the type? What's the configuration? You know, of the airspace that's overlying the locations you're considering. Terrain. What's the surrounding terrain? You know, are, are there are there mountains? Are there tall buildings that are going to impact, you know, how a flight arrives and departs, you know, from that location? Um, compatibility with existing routes and existing instrument flight procedures, you know, that that's a big one. Looking at the current, we'll call it airspace infrastructure around airports and, and potential locations and seeing how that compatibility would look. Um, that That's location, but the other, you know, important decision a community is going to make is what's the mission of that vertical port because like we said it's the community's decision as to whether or not to build a vertical port and for what purpose that's going to make a big difference in what that operation looks like and how it integrates into the larger NAS. you know just a couple examples if a community decides they want to build a, a vertical port in in a community and connect use that to connect with a few flights a day with some other close by communities the the airspace integration needs of that scenario would be much different than if they wanted to build a vertiport and have a every 15 minute flight to and from a large hub airport to connect the scheduled air carrier flights the the impact and integration considerations would be much different in those two scenarios so, you know, the encouraging potential operators like you've heard here today to really engage with communities, engage early, engage often, and, you know, consider some of these factors as you're having conversations as, as those, as your potential plans for advanced air mobility evolve. Okay, so what I took away from that is it's, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to pivot again here and kind of get us back to community engagement by asking a number of the panel members here, who should conduct community engagement? I'm going to ask Kevin to kick us off on that one. So, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, Colleen, you know, we started it here at the local level, right? Because, you know, I think it was Tip O'Neill said all oh, politics is local. So, uh, we started here at the local level. Uh, those of us who understand Tip O'Neill with the Massachusetts accent, right? Um, but anyway, uh, so we started there locally and it really was engaging a number of stakeholders, um, not only the local homeowners, like I mentioned earlier, but you know, like local elected officials um, doing engagement with some of the OEMs that are developing the aircraft, looking at some of the, Philip mentioned about operators and, and so on, all those different groups uh, we're a part of our outreach, and it just kind of we're doing, a, in a sense, a layered approach, starting off at the local level and kind of taking that a little bit at a time. So I thought was it's it's better to get kind of that. This is what's coming out. What do you think? And getting the feedback before you get too far down that line. 
And I did catch that tip, on, tip on you. Comment. Uh, so I want to take that question, who should conduct community engagement, and just add on to it a little bit and talk about the workforce development aspect. So Bill, both Jason and Scott spoke to that. So maybe Jason, could you touch on, on that a little bit and then we'll pass it over to Scott. Well, uh, and again, like that that whole idea of community engagement, you know, it's 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 all of us, all the stakeholders coming together. But when you develop a workforce where, again, we have to, you know, be predictive here at the university level because parents are bringing their, their, uh, their children here, they're investing a significant amount of money in their education, especially the post-secondary education, and we have to tell them, this is where you may end up in a job. And we have to be predictive and say, okay, working with the community, what does advanced air mobility hold for us the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and, and that's a big, big issue of community engagement, community development. Uh, one of the things that we do, I mentioned um, a couple of the things that we're doing in terms of outreach, the FAA Drone Day next Saturday is a big day when a lot of high school students will come through um, our airport and learn about drones and learn about the potential um, future that advanced air mobility holds for them. Um, and then they get excited about that. Here in terms of the workforce development is also getting our students involved in the current research projects that we're working in. Um, I can't I can't stress enough the the ODOT competition on Vertipar Challenge here in Ohio. Really, um, you know, our team of students who who led that research, um, uh, uh, developing the en energy infrastructure, what that's going to look like to supply the electricity for the drones using solar power over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Looking at the current infrastructure and then watching the students really get excited and actually really in front of our eyes carving out what those next careers look like. So for us, it's, you know, working, I don't want to say, you know, one student at a time. Yes, it is uh, working with the community at large saying this is what uh, what we're doing here at Kent State, but also this is what the future holds and, and trying to predict what that's going to look like. And again, the big thing is, is trying to figure out where those students um well, or where those jobs will be uh, for the future and, and where that demand is. Right, thanks, Jason. Scott, any any words on that one? Yeah, I think when you're considering the workforce development side of this, you have to sort of understand what are all the components that are either similar or different than existing traditional aviation, the infrastructure itself, what powers that, what builds it up, how are the aircraft built, how are they serviced, who's going to be either in the aircraft or piloting it from the ground, software requirements on the back end. You're adding in a lot of these sort of advanced technologies and newer ideas that are in some ways flowing into traditional aviation, but how can we build up the already a lot of existing infrastructure that's there, get departments of education focused on it, understanding what funding needs to be done, what curriculum changes need to happen, are there new apprenticeships that need to happen, any new cert certifications for maintenance and things like that. I think those are sort of it, we're not doing something completely new. There's already a lot of workforce development that happens for existing aviation here in the United States. So working with a lot of those existing stakeholders and getting them around on the idea that this is a newer form that is just sort of building off of that. So last word on this particular question, who should conduct community engagement? I'm gonna ask Beth White from FAA to um, cover it, cover that from FAA perspective. Beth? Thanks, Colleen. Um, I think one of the things that uh, the FAA has experienced when we're considering airspace changes is how beneficial uh, it was really for us to exceed the guidance that we were given from the National Environmental Policy Act. And it's one of the reasons why we call our efforts enhanced community engagement. I think if you've seen a lot of our workshops, you'll see exactly what we're doing here today is you're, you're having a conversation with a lot of voices. You're making sure that everybody who's involved in the process is, is part of that. And I think that's what we're all kind of talking about here so much today is making sure that you do get people into the process early. I mean, engagement is more than just answering complaints from the public, right? Engagement is really trying to bring everyone along when those larger decisions are being considered. Um, I, that's really why we're hosting this meeting. There's significant decisions and choices right now that community leaders and operators are considering, and those are not dissimilar from choices that communities have made over the years 
when they're deciding about their needs for transportation and how those should connect, right? Highways, trains and metros, you know, we heard Philip talking about the metro in DC uh, connections and even the decisions, you know, about, about community airports. Um, you know, we talked about this before too, that the FAA is not, is not the, the decider here or the chooser for communities and operators. These are very important, potentially generational conversations and decisions for community leaders and community members who live in these areas. And I think having that the best information and managing expectations for, for all that are involved can, can lead to better decisions and then better outcomes for everyone. So. All right, thanks so much, Beth. All right, we're running a little uh, close to our time. So I'm gonna do one more question and I'm gonna ask Shauna Barry from our Office of Environment and Energy to, to answer this one for us. Um, Shauna, what is a federal action and why is it important? Thanks, Colleen. And thank you to Beth for sort of teeing up. Um, so Beth mentioned the National Environmental Policy Act and federal action is actually a term of art under that act. We call it NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA for short. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar, NEPA is a procedural statute. Um, it requires that federal agencies like the FAA consider the environmental consequences of our decision making and then disclose any significant impacts to the public. And it's required both for actions directly undertaken by the FAA but also for actions taken by another entity that the FAA has some sort of approval authority over. In the context of AAM, examples of FAA actions uh, that might trigger NEPA include things like approving a modification to an airport layout plan, to add a vert report on the, the types of airports that Mike was referencing, or projects that require development or changes to air traffic procedures. Understanding uh, the potential environmental impacts of AAM operations and community concerns around them is going to be really important as we prepare to integrate these vehicles into the airspace. Um, and so the distinction between what is and what is not a federal action is going to become really important because when there is a federal action, the FAA is responsible for complying with NEPA, including the community engagement requirements that are a part of that process. Um, on the flip side, as has I think been alluded to, we expect that some AM, some AAM actions could occur in situations where there won't be an FAA approval. Um, for example, establishment of some private vertiports. So in those situations, FAA oversight and engagement uh, will be relatively limited and other proponents of the operation, such as state and local government agencies, they're gonna need to take the lead in engaging with communities and understanding those environmental impacts. Thank you, Shauna. Um, Mike, anything from the Office of Airports you'd like to add to that? Yeah, and I'll make this real quick. So it really starts with planning. Planning is key uh, to the success of any of these projects, whether FAA has oversight um, or not. Proper planning will be the foundation uh, to any proposed action under NEPA. And I can tell you from our experience, the quickest way to delay or at worst derail a project is incomplete or inadequate planning. So just keep that in mind as you move forward with a proposed project. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we are uh, out of time and I'm sure we could keep this panel going. Um, and this is not the end of the conversation. This is just the beginning of the conversation. If you have questions, please reach out to your local FAA regional administrator. As I mentioned, I'm the regional administrator in New England, but there are nine of us across the country. And that would be a great place for you to start if you have questions and we will help you get to the right part of FAA or even answer your questions ourselves. So as I mentioned before, and Mike just also mentioned, but it bears repeating, like any aviation project, planning is a necessary step to introduce AAM into your community. Today's speakers discussed some examples of that planning process. We hope that the city, regional, and state planners who are considering bringing AAM operations to their communities can use this meeting to better understand things you may need to consider and factor into your plans. So this concludes today's webinar on AAM community engagement. On behalf of the FAA, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their participation. 
We do anticipate future follow-up webinars on this topic, so stay tuned to FAA website and our YouTube channel. Hopefully we'll be able to answer some questions live next time around. So thank you for attending and have a great afternoon.